the glorious King Arthur, Artoria Pendragon. Upon drawing Caliburn, the Sword of Selection becomes the once and future King of Britain. In her court at Camelot, she gathers honorable knights to serve at the Round Table, protecting Britain from Saxon invasions. Perhaps her most dependable knight happens to be a distant relative, Sir Gawain, the White Knight of the Round Table, who mirrors her glory in varying ways. This is significant, as Artoria's pursuit of kingship has robbed her of any hope of normalcy. The peace she fights for is never something she can personally experience. Through Gawain, however, Artoria is blessed with an ally who will always be on her side. When Artoria is gifted Excalibur, Sword of Promised Victory, by Vivian, the Lady of the Lake, Gawain is entrusted with Excalibur's sister sword, Excalibur Galatine, the resurrected Sword of Victory. Unlike Excalibur, which is a blade that illuminates the night, Galatine derives power from the sun, blessing Gawain when basking in the sun's rays. When fully invoked, it allows him to conjure a miniature sun that combines its energy with an elongated swing of the blade, engulfing his enemies in a wave of heat and a giant ball of fire. The relationship between the two swords also represents the responsibilities between Artoria and Gawain. While the king is the night, Gawain is the day. His loyalty and resemblance allow him to be the king's impersonator on occasion, serving as stand-in while the king is away. He is even considered to take the king's place should she fall. That said, Gawain does not believe for a moment that his king will ever meet her end. She is the ideal knight, and by watching her fight in the vanguard, Gawain is certain Britain will have a bright future. His tasks in the court include collecting debts and serving as Artoria's right-hand man. He performs these duties stoically while maintaining an air of polite sincerity. In general, he is free from negative emotions, bearing a refreshing attitude on the battlefield, never looking down on his enemies. For the most part, he too embodies the ideal knight and is considered just as powerful by many. Despite these qualities, his blind admiration for King Arthur clouds his judgment, preventing him from seeing her suffering. On a lighter note, he advocates for quantity over quality in food, enjoying large amounts of potatoes, bread, and vegetables. This is partially why the king is rarely able to feast upon tasteful cuisine. His ignorance in the end, however, causes him to consider the king's glory over her own well-being. While he is ever confident in Artoria, one battle renders him fearful, such that he fights behind her, gazing upon his king's back. After eleven major battles against the Saxons, they meet their final confrontation with the demonic dragon Vortigern, Britain's greatest threat. This monster, with but a single strike, hurls soldiers into the air with enough force and scorching heat to evaporate them. Excalibur Galatine is weakened without the sun's power to enhance it, and even Excalibur itself shines dim in Vortigern's presence. They fight for several hours, enveloped by dark clouds summoned by Vortigern's beastly roar. As the dragon devours both weapons and corpses alike, Gawain shouts to Artoria, advising retreat, and yet the king will not back down, requesting Gawain's assistance to the end. She assures him not to underestimate each other as wielders of the Holy Swords, admitting that their strength cannot amount to much if they cannot even save the people. Thus, with restored morale, Gawain and Artoria suppress Vortigern once more, and Gawain scores a strike. His blade pins Vortigern, while Artoria tears through its opposing side, using Excalibur to ground their enemy. The two are left unarmed, or so Gawain thinks, until Artoria draws the Pendragon's sacred lands, Rongominiad. The Solar Knight Gawain watches as Artoria invokes the Lance's true name and brutally slays their enemy. In the pouring rain, the fallen dragon curses Uther and his bloodline, claiming that no king of dragon blood can save Britain through the declining of the Age of Gods. His death will not secure Britain's prosperity. While taken aback by her uncle's words, Artoria nonetheless boasts her victory turning Vortigern to dust by drawing her lands. 
Gawain stares upon her as she shines brilliantly in her victory. He is certain that, so long as they have Arthur, Britain has nothing to fear. However, the king's military prowess proves insufficient in saving Britain. Other issues, such as plague and drought, assail the land. The people feel betrayed after having been promised a glorious future under their new king. They continue to depend on, but also reprimand her for her failings. Artoria accepts all of this. By bearing the burden of their frustrations, she suffers, but through it, unity is brought to her people. Regardless, Britain continues to suffer from invasions. Without hesitation, she proceeds to make difficult decisions, making sacrifices for survival while abandoning her emotions. Gawain's admiration blinds him from her pain, but he nonetheless supports her. Other knights, however, misunderstand Artoria's selflessness, instead finding her lacking in humanity. Gawain's loyalty is all the more important in light of these harsh times, and yet, even his resolve proves vulnerable. His greatest regret is in his dispute with Sir Lancelot. The two knights, while being Artoria's finest companions, become sworn enemies. While Sir Agravain learns that Artoria's wife, Lady Guinevere, is involved in an affair with Lancelot, he threatens her. In defense, Lancelot fights for his love's sake, slaying Agravain, along with Gawain's siblings, Gareth and Gaheris. In his escape with Guinevere, he even manages to wound Gawain, leaving a violent grudge in his wake. Gawain is unable to forget that Lancelot killed his siblings. His pure nature prevents him from forgiveness. Reasonably, he loves his family very much. Lancelot not only killed my brothers, that Black Knight even betrayed the king. He kidnapped the king's wife. How do you expect that to be forgiven? It comes as a shock when he learns that Artoria, on the other hand, chooses to pardon Lancelot for his crimes. She trusts Lancelot's convictions, believing he must have had a reason to oppose her. She accepts any blame Lancelot may have felt. Both Gawain and Lancelot fail to understand this pardon, being stricken with rage and guilt respectively. The king may have forgiven Lancelot, but Gawain refuses to do so. This is understandable, but ultimately contributes to Artoria's demise. While Artoria is away on a campaign in Rome, Mordred steps up and rallies the people. Even though the king continued to protect Britain, she could not alleviate the people's suffering, pushing them too hard in an effort to create an even better country in the long run. Essentially, while prosperity certainly awaits them, Britain's people are unable to see that promise and can no longer hold out. In the political confusion, many knights join under Mordred to overthrow the king and form an army near the shores of Camelon to greet the king on her return. All of Artoria's efforts establishing peace in Rome are for naught, as her weary soldiers are thrust from one fight into another. When she needs her trusted knights most, they are stuck fighting among themselves. Lancelot, seeking redemption, heads to the Battle of Camelon to aid Artoria, but is adamantly rejected by Gawain. The excommunication still stands, and Artoria is left without a strong asset. Gawain, true to his convictions, fights valiantly to protect his king, but is unable to continue as Mordred strikes him in the same wound he incurred from Lancelot's rampage. Perhaps Lancelot's assistance could have turned the tide of battle, but without him, there is certain ruin. Both Artoria and Mordred are left alone to finish the fight, which results in both of them receiving fatal blows. The king is technically victorious, but this proves to be her final battle, beyond which Britain meets its end. Artoria, on her deathbed, makes a pact with the planet to pursue the Grail, dooming her to a nearly eternal fate with the sword. Gawain, too, in death, yearns to make amends, regretting how his personal grudge invited Artoria's defeat. He believes he should have also forgiven Lancelot, honoring Artoria's decision. In the chance there is a next time, if there is an opportunity to restore my honor, a second life, then at that time, I will devote my everything to the king. His valiance as a knight, as well as his lingering wish, allow him to be recorded into the throne of heroes. This is true for various universes. 
though his fate changes between them. In one world, mankind struggles with Earth's lack of mana, and mages seek haven by hacking into a supercomputer on the moon. The Moon Cell, recognizing the demand of its powers, the Moon Cell decides to hold various Holy Grail wars, with itself as the prize, to select who to grace with its advanced technology. On Earth, the Harvey family owns 60% of the world's wealth. Their pursuit for dominance causes the family to also seek dominion of the Moon Cell. Thus, Leonardo B. Harvey is born from the family's head and his mother Alicia. By the age of three, the family declares him to be the next in line, subjecting him to continual surgeries. They use magecraft to etch information directly into his brain. He is also distanced from his loving mother to be raised as an exemplary master candidate. Leo's brother, Julius, considered unworthy of the family's inheritance, is tasked with protecting the young heir. To ensure Leo's legacy, Julius is ordered to murder his own mother. Fearing the possibility of anyone else obtaining the Holy Grail before them, the Harveys dispatch Leo into the Moon Cell to compete in the Holy Grail War. In preparation, he luckily summons none other than Gawain as his Saber-class servant. From their first meeting, Gawain resolves himself to serving Leo, just as he served his former king. This is Gawain's second chance, an opportunity to perfect himself as a loyal knight, setting aside himself for the sake of Leo's victory. That said, Gawain sees Leo as a younger brother and feels obligated to help him grow. While overprotective, Gawain notices how Leo has never once experienced defeat and hopes to see his master grow before ever finding out. Alongside this, the Moon Cell, in constructing a space for the competitors, the Serial Phantasm, uses the data of a preserved medical patient, Hakuno Kishinami, to create an AI-controlled NPC. By accident, however, this AI winds up gaining a sense of self, a complete cyber frame, and is dragged into the same Holy Grail War as Leo. Early on, Hakuno and Leo become rivals as they make their way through the tournament. Gawain, unlike his knightly self, insults Hakuno's servant, Nero Claudius, calling her the Whore of Babylon. Despite this, Gawain's sword swings true, earning his master one victory after another. In battle, one can argue that Gawain's skill surpasses even King Arthur's, that is, during the day when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. This manifests in a skill called the Numeral of the Saint, marking specific hours of the day when his abilities triple. In this state, he is practically invincible. In addition to Gawain's protection, Leo is assisted throughout the war by his brother Julius, who acts from the shadows to turn the tide of battle in Leo's favor. In this endeavor, both Gawain and Julius work well together, despite how Julius resembles Lancelot. As the war progresses, Hakuno is pitted up against Julius and manages to defeat him and his servant, Li Xuan. Thus, only two masters remain in the running, Hakuno and Leo, who face each other in their final bout. Hakuno and Nero struggle while Leo basks in his confidence and pride, causing an exploitable opening to emerge. In their fight, Hakuno is able to block the sun, severely limiting Gawain's strength. Nero takes the opportunity and strikes him down. Accepting their loss, Leo finally experiences defeat and thanks Gawain for his loyal services. In response, Gawain admits that serving Leo as a second king has been an honor. According to the rules of the war, Leo is killed and Gawain fades away, returning to the Moon Cell Automaton. Miraculously, Hakuno goes on to defeat the war's greatest opponent, twice H. Peaceman, and is acknowledged by the Moon Cell as the legitimate victor. They are granted the Moon Cell's power in the form of a ring, the Regalia. After a brief peace in Seraph, conflict emerges as three separate forces wage war against each other to unite the Regalia and unify Seraph. Their leaders, Nero, Tamamo no Mae, and Altera, begin to bolster their ranks by calling forth servants from the previous war. In the case of Nero, she gathers a force that consists of a newly summoned Gawain. 
His loyalty and virtue remain as he pledges himself to the Roman Emperor. While serving valiantly under Nero's army, Gawain encounters a familiar phase, his own king, Artoria Pendragon. He discovers she has been summoned by the Mooncell as a top servant, an unaffiliated warrior tasked with resolving conflicts on Serov. Setting the matter aside, Gawain performs his duties as Nero's knight and takes it upon himself to find Artoria once more and properly convey his feelings. He vanquishes Nero's enemies and runs to his true king. Kneeling before her, Gawain apologizes for denying Lancelot's assistance in the Battle of Camlon and pledges himself to her once more. He declares that he is prepared to end his third life if Artoria commands it as punishment. Instead, the virtuous king of knights asks only that Gawain continue to serve as the Knight of the Sun. She affirms that, no matter who Gawain goes on to serve, he will always be one of her knights, her pride and joy. After all, following the conflict on Serov, Artoria will vanish. In turn, Gawain vows that in any life, Artoria will always be his king. Thus, while Gawain enjoys his third life in Serov, he does so with pride. Not all worlds are quite as fortunate, however. In another, mankind struggles to reverse Getia's incineration by sending masters into various singularities. There exists a time in which Artoria, dying from her wounds following the fight against Mordred, clings to her holy spear. Sir Bedivere does not return Excalibur to the Lady of the Lake, unable to accept the king's death. Thus, Artoria survives when she should have perished and finds herself transformed into the emotionless goddess Rongomeniad by the Lance's influence. As a goddess, she wanders between worlds before entering into a singularity where she re-establishes her kingdom at Camelot, turning it into a holy city where only those she allows can live. To enforce her law, the goddess, calling herself the Lion King, summons all of her former knights of the Round Table. She explains her plans to purge the unworthy offering each of the knights the chance to join or oppose her. Sir Gawain, having vowed to use his second life to loyally obey his king and all her wishes unquestionably, chooses to aid her, even at the expense of killing his former comrades in arms, including his sibling Gaheris. For his loyalty, the Lion King offers him a gift, knightlessness, ensuring that the sun shines upon him at all hours. The remaining knights of the Lion King set out to slaughter all those who oppose them and the Holy Selection. The Lion King is no longer the same King Gawain once admired, but nonetheless, he follows her orders to repent for the mistakes of his first life. His loyalty surpasses that of his other knights. Gareth cannot handle the cruelty demanded of her, and during the night's fight against Richard the Lionheart, she sacrifices her life to restrain him. Using this opening, Gawain kills both friend and foe for the Lion King's sake. To serve his inhuman king, he casts aside his own humanity. As other opponents approach Camelot's gate, Gawain stands guard, slaying those who are deemed unworthy. In this role, he defends Camelot against Ritsuka Fujimaru, the Caldea Security Organization's only master, the one remaining hope for humanity. While he fails to kill Ritsuka in the encounter, he still stands as the greatest threat in their attempt to breach the city. To penetrate his line of defense, Ritsuka gains the help of King Hassan, the Old Man of the Mountain, the world's most deadly assassin and founder of the Hashashin. King Hassan enters the battlefield, using sandstorms to block out the sun. Weakened, Gawain duels Hassan in futility, losing his only chance to strike with the passing of the evening bell. While distracted in his bout, Gawain has failed to protect the city, as Ritska, their servant Mashu Kyrielite, and his former ally Sir Bedivere climb to the city's top to the Lion King's throne room. Gathering all of his strength, Gawain catches up to the assault team and serves as the king's last line of defense. Outmatched and worn down, Gawain falls to Bedivere's noble phantasm, Argitlam. His desperate attempt to protect his inhuman king ends in failure. Though he disappears, allowing Ritska to resolve the singularity, it is not the last time he encounters the Chaldean Master. When summoned to other singularities, Gawain appears to be fighting for his own reasons, and willingly helps Chaldea. 
here, his virtue is skewed. Although he was devoted to his marriage and life, he now finds himself open to further relationships, preferring the company of well-endowed maidens. Despite this change, Gawain's new dedication to serving as Ritzka's sword brings him back to fighting for the same goals as his precious King Arthur, to protect not only Britain, but all of humanity. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell as if it were your waifu. That way you'll never miss out on all of my anime content, lore videos, live streams, and Holy Waifu Wars polls. My vids are struggling to get featured, so that bell is absolutely critical. If you want to support me directly, check out my Patreon, or consider donating via Super Chat. And as always, celebrate your fandom!